Hello, everyone, and welcome to today's time series meetup. Of course, normally we have these meetups in person, but um, we're super excited to see everyone online today. My name is Caitlin Croft. I work here at Influx Data, and I'm super excited that we are going to have Will and Scott um, here talking about how they're using InfluxDB to monitor their barbecues. Um, we'll just give everyone a couple of minutes to join. Um, so just a few friendly reminders and housekeeping items. The session is being recorded and it will be made available for replay on our website as well as on YouTube later today. So if you wanna go back and rewatch it or review the slides, you will be able to do so later today. And we have these events every month. Um, the next one is in January and it's all about home brewing. Uh, one of our influxers is using InfluxDB to monitor his home brewing setup. What's really fun, um, I'm sure a lot of your companies have you know, silly Slack channels within your workspace. And one of the more fun ones here at Influx Data is called Influx Pits and it's all about barbecuing. So. It's a lot of fun. It's really fun seeing all the different things that people um, are barbecuing. And I feel like people's barbecue game has probably increased during the pandemic as we're all stuck at home and cooking at home and need something more fun to do. So um, I think it'll be a really great session. Um, and also we, you know, even though I, the end of the year is winding down, we do have another fantastic webinar tomorrow. It is with uh, Tim Hall, and if you attended Influx Days, you of course know that we announced InfluxDB uh, 2.0 open source is um, generally available. Uh, Tim will be providing an update for the entire community to talk about what we've done even since Influx Days. So if you have any questions, I think it'll be a really great, um, It'll be a really great webinar. It's tomorrow at 8 a.m. Pacific. I'll drop a link in the chat uh, here just in a couple of minutes so you can go and register for it if you're interested. Um, so it'll be and it'll be recorded, like I said. So if you if you can't make it tomorrow, it's totally fine. So uh, today's time series meetup, uh, we will um, you know, please feel free to put any questions you may have in the Q&A box and Scott and Will will answer them at the end. And if you want to be unmuted, I'm happy to unmute you. I know meetups are a little tricky being online and virtual, but I definitely want to encourage and allow you guys to talk directly with um, our speakers. So at the end, if you want to be unmuted, I'm happy to do so. Um, and I'm sure Will and Scott would be more than happy to talk to someone else on this webinar besides me. <laughs> so um, just quickly going over our agenda today. Um, so I will quickly introduce our speakers. They will give their presentations and there will be time for Q&A at the end. And if, you know, this has been quite the year, especially if you are looking for a job. So we always like to give our community the opportunity to share either any job opportunities that you know of or if you are looking for a job. Um, I know here at Influx Data, we are looking for a lot of engineers. So if you are interested, please be sure to check out our careers page. Um, we, you know, we love hiring our community members. We definitely have a lot of employees who started out just by being a fantastic community member who, you know, maybe they contribute a lot, we notice them and then, hey, they were looking for a job. So. Uh, don't be shy, definitely apply online if you're interested. And also, if you want to present on a future time series meetup, please feel free to reach out to me. Even if you're not necessarily using InfluxDB, we love sharing stories about how anyone is using time series data. So um, please feel free to reach out if you have a cool use case, whether it is a fun project at home, like monitoring your barbecue, or if it's something you're doing um, at work that you would like to share with the community. So without further ado, I'm going to um, hand it off to Will and Scott. So Will is part of our engineering team and Scott is part of our uh, docs team. So you may see them in the community or even the community Slack and all that. So I will let you guys take it from here. 
Thank you very much, Caitlin. Uh, hello, everybody. I'll talk to you today about my sort of adventure through um, doing doing it myself, through to buying commercial off the shelf off the shelf software and uh, oh, sorry hardware, and then ultimately ending up using Cloud Two to do a lot of my monitoring of sensors and especially with my barbecue sensor. Uh, how I got there, why I ended up uh, going down that route. Um, and yeah, hopefully we'll learn a little bit along the way. So from the sort of early days of, of uh, home automation and an IoT, I, I looked at this, these sensors, traditionally temperature sensors, and thought, well, I can, I can build that myself and it won't cost anything at all. Why would I pay somebody money? Um, and I've invested quite a lot of time and energy in that. And I started out um, looking at Nest thermostats, Nest learning thermostats. And these cost like $200. Um, and as far as I could tell, I could build one at home for nothing. I could build it for free. All I had to do was, first of all, learn how my home heating system was wired and then build all of the electronics for that and some relays to switch various uh, 240 volt power supplies on and off to all the various pumps and valves and controllers that are on my home heating system. Um, this is a, a wiring diagram for a, a, what's called a Y plan in the UK. Uh, and you've got pumps to pump the hot water around, electric signal to go to the boiler to tell it when to switch on and start burning gas and heating up water. You've got a, a valve here, which will send the uh, hot water through your central heating system or through to your hot water tank to heat up your water. Uh, a thermostat to turn off when the uh, room is up to temperature or a cylinder stat to turn off when the hot water is up to temperature. So a nice, fairly easy uh, wiring diagram and then just, you know, pop the old controller off the wall and be met with uh, something that doesn't quite look like the wiring diagram that was uh, presented previously. Um, but nevertheless, we will persevere. So we'll, we'll find out what each of these wires do, and then we'll connect up some, some relays to that. Uh, and then we'll have something that we can configure and, and turn on and off from the internet, because that's a sensible use of time. And then, of course, you need to define all of the software to do that and the architecture. And so, well, OK, we'll have something that switches the relays on and off, and then we'll need something to, to schedule the end to the, the the heating schedule to come on in the mornings and turn off at the evenings. And then we'll need some temperature sensing so that we can turn off when particular rooms get up to temperature. And then we want some kind of external control here so we can toggle it on and off from our phone and from our website. Uh, so we'll build all of that. We'll build a REST API. We'll do that. That's fine. Then we need some kind of you know, actual physical thermostat. And, and now we need to uh, define this, draw it ourselves, define all of the UI, uh, lay it all out, write all the software for that. Um, and then we're going to need some graphing because, of course, you can't sense temperature without actually putting it on a graph somewhere. So we need to do all of that. And, and here we leverage the, the Google Charts API. So we'll just learn the Google Charts API and then we'll start producing some logs and, uh, and then the system is complete. And of course, costs absolutely nothing apart from probably a few hundred hours and, you know, a playing with mains electricity. Uh, but yeah, I built it for free. So that's great. And then on to the next project. Oh, a smoke alarm, a nest smoke alarm. Oh, that sounds like a good idea. I bet I could uh, build one of those myself for less than $120. And so what you do is go on eBay and buy a cheap smoke alarm, or in this case, carbon monoxide detector, take it apart, work out how you could hook in an Arduino into all of this uh, so that you could send us a radio signal when the alarm goes off. Just bodge it together, plug it in, wire it up. There we go. A free carbon monoxide detector that's definitely safe. And you would definitely want to trust your uh, your children's fam and family's lives to that. But anyway, it didn't cost anything. It was free. So that's great. And then after you've done this a few times, you start to realize that perhaps doing it this way is, is perhaps not the, the best way to do it. And so I... It was a yeah, it was a very good way of, of learning uh, all of this stuff, and it was a fun hobby. But it probably wasn't the best answer to the to the problem. And so you start looking at commercial off the shelf um, hardware. Um, it comes in a very nice box. You, you can't well, you could three D print something like this, but it's not going to be quite as as nice. These are a lot smaller. They're designed by people who actually know how to design circuit boards. 
and yeah, they're reliable and they're relatively cheap as well. These ones here are um, Xiaomi ones. You can get them on um, eBay and, and Banggood and import them from China for, I think these are about 10 pounds each. These are about the same. I think this is a bit less. This is a door sense. It's perhaps eight pounds or something like that. And it comes with a, with a hub that you plug into the wall and it comes with its own app. And so for not very much money really, and, and when you take into account the amount of time and energy that went into building it yourself, you find that actually this is the, the cheaper option. But it does have one downside, which is that you are then tied into this, uh, this, this ecosystem. And sometimes it can be quite difficult to get your data out and do something a bit more exciting with it. Um, this Xiaomi Home Hub does actually allow you to export the data to it. But all of this stuff is built on Zigbee. Uh, which is a relatively open protocol, well-documented protocol. And you can get a pretty cheap um, dongle that you can plug into a Raspberry Pi or something like that, which is able to receive the signals from these devices and turn it into uh, an MQTT um, topic. And then you can publish that on your network. And as soon as you can get it onto your network, then you can start doing something with that data. Uh, and Telegraph makes it very easy to get that MQTT data straight into Influx DB Cloud 2. Um, and we'll talk a little bit more about that in a minute. So this is the, the solution that I finally settled on for my um, home monitoring needs, commercial off the shelf hardware, which comes in a nice box, runs on batteries for a very long time, really well designed, doesn't cost too much money, and then a mechanism to allow me to get that data and, and do what I want with it and, and not necessarily be tied into a commercial platform. So learned some, some useful lessons there. Um, and then built some dashboards in cloud two. And, and it was around this time that I'd started at Influx Data. And in order to learn the, the platform, uh, I thought I'd build some dashboards and do something with all the data that I was getting from these commercial off the shelf sensors. And so very quickly, I could throw away all of my hacked together Google Charts API JavaScript and leverage the platform that Influx Data had built. And very, very quickly, um, it became apparent that I could I could build dashboards like this in in minutes instead of like days or even even weeks. So that was it. I was sold then that this is the, a good solution and this was better than than anything that I could build on my own. Uh, and and as Caitlin said earlier, we've got a Slack channel um, on our internal Slack, which is uh, Influx Pits, where people were talking about barbecuing. And I've been thinking about getting uh, a smoker for a while, and so I went and asked some questions in there. Um, and people recommended that we, the, not only do you get a, a very well a variety of different smokers, but you also get some mechanism to monitor that fairly closely. And the, the, as you might have noticed, the theme here is that I'm not going to go and buy uh, the the full system. That I want something that I can sort of hack to my own uh, to my own needs. And so I ended up buying this particular um, thermostat because it we used Bluetooth low energy or Bluetooth smart, they call it sometimes, um, and would publish the, sense, the, the temperature that it was sensing on uh, Bluetooth, which once it's on the air on Bluetooth, then I should be able to intercept that um, with a Raspberry Pi. And then I can do something that I want with it. Um, this one, it's only $40. Uh, it's got four sensors plugged into it. It's got a rechargeable battery so you can um, leave it outside on top of your barbecue or your smoker and it will then just transmit the the readings out onto bluetooth but it wasn't quite that easy um, first of all i needed to learn a little bit more about bluetooth low energy it's not quite as easy as just um, connecting to the like pairing to the device and then getting the data pushed to you um, because Bluetooth low energy has been designed to use a lot less power, like half the amount of power of normal Bluetooth, there are some trade-offs in the way that you interact with it. Uh, the big one is that you don't have a lot of bandwidth to this thing. Uh, theoretically, two megabits um, is the maximum, but realistically, you're talking in the tens of kilobits per second, um, which for uh, a, a large, um, you know, I don't know, uh, uh, sound um, audio device is probably not enough, but if all you're doing is sending um, a few bytes of temperature sensor data every few seconds, then it, it's more than enough. 
Um, and because of the low energy requirements, it also has a different RF modulation scheme, which is a lot simpler and so uses a lot less energy. Um, and the downside is that it generally doesn't have quite as good a range as normal Bluetooth. But again, it's out, the barbecue's outside, the Raspberry Pi is quite easy to sort of hide around the house near, near to where it needs to be. So it didn't, didn't actually become a problem. Um, but the benefits is that it is well supported under Linux and it is a pretty standards compliant protocol. Uh, and there's quite a lot of documentation about how you can actually uh, connect up to a pair with a, a Bluetooth low energy device and then actually use it to get the data off of. Um, so did some experimentation. Uh, I found a few people had, had done something similar um, and I ended up having to learn quite a bit more about how Bluetooth low energy worked in order to, to get this thing to work. Uh, and since I had to learn it, now you get to hear about it as well. Uh, and so you switch on the thermostat and the first thing you need to do is authenticate against it. Um, and that's usually done with a pre-shared key. Uh, these devices typically come with an app for your phone. And so you install the app, um, you uh, pair with the device. And while you're doing that, you run a Bluetooth sniffer on a Raspberry Pi and you can try and sniff off the pre-shared key or you can dump the, um, the Android app, for example, unpack it and you can go finding this key. So we've got the key, um, we can connect to the device and then the next thing you need to do is ask what characteristics it has. And being a, um, a barbecue temperature sensor, the characteristics it has typically are, I will tell you what the temperature is. And in this case, I will also tell you what the battery level is. So you'd go through some handshake here and you connect to the device. It, you have to ask it what it can do, it tells you, and then you can subscribe to those characteristics. Uh, and in order to actually get the information off of it, it won't push the full packet to you with all the temperature in it. It will, it will put like a single bit up that says, I have some information for you. And then you have to connect to it and pull that data off. Um, and that means that if you're not actively uh, pulling that data off all the time, then it's very, very low power. So learn how Bluetooth low energy works. Wasn't too bad, um, got that all working up and now I can, uh, I can read temperature sensor information off of this device from a Python script on a, a Raspberry Pi. Uh, some technical information here. Uh, we don't need to go into this too much, but um, this is these are the sort of the, the pre-shared key is here. Um, and then these are the characteristics. There's a few settings in there that it tells you about. You can switch the units. It will tell you the battery level. Um, and yeah, we don't need to get into that. Uh, okay, so now we've got the temperature data, uh, data coming out of the thermostat and we're being uh, received onto the Raspberry Pi, we need to actually do something with it and move it around my local network and then get it stored somewhere so that we can start putting it on a graph and we can start interacting with it. Um, and so in order to get the data into uh, Cloud2, you've got a few different options. Um, starting at the DIY end of the, the spectrum, is to write raw protocol, uh, raw line protocol into Cloud2. Line protocols, um, our standard way of, of defining data, it's um, documented on our website and it's pretty low overhead. It's not very complex. There's a few um, strings in there for topics and, and uh, sorry, for fields and tags, uh, and then you can just put the numbers in there. And it's it's easy enough that you could write a, your own client library to do it. You could write your own like Arduino code to do it. it it's not got a lot of overhead. Uh, and so it's good for these low power devices. We do have a huge range of client libraries available as well. Um, there are Arduino ones, there are Python ones, there are Golang ones, um, lots and lots of those uh, available and they're all dead easy to use as well. Uh, and then at the top of the stack, we have Telegraph, which I talked a little bit about earlier on. This is our agent, uh, which uh, will collate information that you send it and then batch it up and send it off to, um, to Cloud2 for you. It will, it will queue on, uh, on Telegraph if it can't connect to the server because your internet connection is down. Um, you can do a lot of the uh, transforming of data just through config files. So you don't actually need to write any code. Um, there are plugins 
of all different sh shapes and sizes to let you query uh, files on the file system, um, performance of databases, performance like temperature of CPUs, uh, loads. There's anything that you can imagine, there's probably a plugin that will let you do it. Um, and yeah, as we say, it, it's ready-made binaries. You can just download them and install them. And I was already using it from my previous um, experiments with uh, with the Xiaomi sensors. So I had it on the network. Uh, I needed to learn a bit more about it. And it was going to be the, the quickest, in my opinion, the quickest and most reliable method to get this um, raw temperature sensor data into, um, into Cloud2 itself. And so I decided to use MQTT as the method to get the data from the Raspberry Pi that was receiving this data to a different server, which was running uh, Telegraph. And I, I'm using MQTT, which is pretty much the, the default uh, mechanism for moving um, sort of home automation sensor IoT data um, around, around a network. MQTT has been around for about 20 years. Uh, it started out at IBM yeah, 20 years ago, and it's pretty much a, a standard now. And in fact, I think it has actually got ratification as a standard way of um, encapsulating, excuse me, data. And again, there are client libraries for every platform and every language. Um, the Python one, in order to send data from the Python script that's receiving the temperature sensor to MQTT, uh, I use Paho very easy to use, um, very reliable. And then, yeah, you need a, a server, a broker on your network. I used Mosquito, again, very small, very easy to set up. Uh, I recommend using that. And then the, at the receiving end, at the Telegraph end, um, I was already using it, and there is this, the node code option. I can just, um, with a config file, tell Telegraph what MQTT topic to listen to, and it will receive the data and then it will be able to send it straight up to cloud two um, for me. Maybe we need to do a little bit of transformation on that data in order to get the, the uh, data types correct. Um, and you can do all that through a config file. Um, I'm going to skip over this slide. I think we're, we're doing okay for time, but I'm going to skip over this slide. Um, it tells you a little bit about uh, the, the format of MQTT. Um, and yeah, we don't need to get into that too much today. Uh, but I will talk about the config for Telegraph. Um, so at the sending end, this is the, the function to send an MQTT message. This is the format. So these are the topics. And then yeah, here is um, the index. So if you remember the picture that I showed of the, uh, of the thermometer, it had four sensors on it. And so this represents which sensor number it is that, that is sending the data. And then as an int, we just put the temperature on the end and it gets sent over to the broker and then received by Telegraph. So on the Telegraph end, you configure it as an MQTT consumer, tell it the IP address of the server. And here I've told it, these are the topics that you should care about. So you can see here, I'm sending barbecue slash temperature slash the index of the temperature center itself. In MQTT, this plus means anything. Uh, so barbecue slash anything. So I'm used to sending temperature here. I could also send battery. So anything that comes in here uh, and has a number here, then um, then that's what we care about. Uh, so this is the, the payload and uh, sorry, this is the topic and then the temperature is the payload. And so we tell uh, Telegraph that the payload is just a value that it doesn't have any extra um, information in there. It's not a JSON string, for example, it is just a number uh, and that number is of type integer. Uh, and then on the output side of things, I tell it that I'm using US West 2 for my Cloud2 um, server. You put an access token in, give it your org name and your bucket ID or bucket name, and that's it. Telegraph will then just take that data that, that the temperature sensor sends in every 10 seconds or so and send it up to uh, to cloud two for you into that bucket. And so once you've done all of that and you uh, switch on your um, your switch on your barbecue, your smoker, and you connect up uh, the sensors, you switch on the temperature sensor, the thermometer, and uh, it starts sending data, then this is what you see. Um, you can see that this is the temperature inside. So I've, I've used two different sensors here, two of those probes. This one here is, is monitoring the inside of the smoker. And so you can see it got switched on here. 
gets up to temperature and then it's pretty accurately holding about 110 degrees C. This is um, pretty accurately holding that temperature because this is an electric smoker and so it's just you know, toggling the, the heating element on and off and you can see that quite clearly here. Uh, and then this blue line is the uh, the probe that's in the meat itself and you can see that heating up fairly linearly over uh, the course of what's this about well not very long actually about sort of half an hour or so increasing quite nicely uh, and it's also sending the um, the battery data in here so the battery is healthy and the, the meat is heating up quite nicely uh, and using this over a period of time you can see quite clearly here the stall which is where the uh, the water that's evaporating off the meat is evaporating at such a rate that it is taking the heat out of the meat as you're trying to cook it um, and it, the heat uh, sorry and the meat then is not quite getting up to the temperature it needs to get to in order to be cooked uh, and so you can see the barbecue is holding a pretty good steady temperature here it's not cooling down but around this period here the meat really starts to slow down and then by this point it's not getting any hotter despite the oven being uh, the same temperature it's really not getting any hotter and so this is the stall here and, and the meat is not going to get to the temperature it needs to to be cooked uh, and so spotting this by looking at the graph um, I could then do something about it and so here you can see the temperature inside the oven drop quite dramatically as I open the door take the meat out wrap it in foil uh, and then put it back in and shut the door and wrapping it in foil is enough to get it out to, to stop the heat loss through evaporation and then drive the meat up to the temperature that it needs to get to to be cooked and then we hit this magic number and I can switch it off uh, take everything out and let it rest ready to eat it uh, and so there we go if you want to have a look at the python script that I wrote that will interface with those particular um, um thermometers then there's a, a link there for github um very welcome uh, any contributions that anybody's got at the moment the project will report the temperatures and the battery levels um and it's got uh, an, a system d script that will automatically detect the thermometer when you switch it on and start logging that data so you don't need to do any sort of manual pairing you just switch the thermometer on and it will start spitting out numbers uh, I'd like to add some better alerting in there so that, for example, when you can detect that you are in the stall, so when the temperature hasn't increased by a certain amount over a period of time, I could get it to send me uh, an instant uh, push message to my phone and tell me that the time has come to go and wrap it in foil. Uh, and I could do that using the, the tasks and alerting system that's built into Cloud2. So that's something I'm going to be working on uh, fairly soon. Um, and then, yeah, a low power mode, you, you can see the battery uh, measurement there um, just, just ticking along. Uh, it was staying pretty high, but if I wanted to do uh, a smoke over the course of, let's say, 12 hours or something like that, um, maybe I don't need to be recording the temperature every 10 seconds. Perhaps once a minute is, is enough. And because of the way Bluetooth Low Energy works, it will have a reading for me, but it won't actually transmit that reading. It won't switch the radio on and, and transmit those bytes of data until I ask for it. And so in theory, asking for it every minute will use less power. Uh, but yes, the most important thing uh, that I want to do is eat more ribs. And that's what I've got planned for the coming summers. Okay, so there we go, that's mine. Um, we'll do some questions at the end and I'll hand over to Scott. Thanks, Will. <clears throat> so, um... I'm gonna apologize ahead of time. I'm gonna be telling Will when to switch slides. He's in control of the slideshow. And Will, I actually have an answer to your problem about alerting the stall. So, um, Caitlin already introduced me. I'll, I'll give you a, a, just a little bit of background about myself. Um, Scott Anderson, I'm the technical lead of the docs team here at Influx Data. Um, I was born and raised in Texas. So smoke is a little bit in my blood. I, I wasn't raised actually doing the smoking, but I was raised eating what was smoked. And it wasn't until my wife surprised me with a, with a Christmas present of a, of a smoker that I began my journey of really learning how to, how to smoke meat. And that was, that was about 12 years ago. So um, I'm, I'm over a decade in. Um, I like to think that I have some deep knowledge on it, but uh, it's one of those things where, where you just keep learning. So the, the way that I collect temperature information is actually really similar to what Will does. Um, a little 
uh, a little simpler to set up, but much less affordable. <laughs> so go ahead to the next slide. So I use a Fireboard. If you aren't familiar with Fireboard, Fireboard is a cloud connected wireless meat thermometer. Um, it, it collects uh, sensor data from whatever probes you have plugged into it and it sends it up to the Fireboard cloud servers. Next slide. So this is the Fireboard that I have. This is the Fireboard one. Um, it's a, it comes in a nice, neat, uh, it, the, the Fireboard itself isn't weatherproof. So I had to get the, they, they sold this, uh, it's a, a, a container. I can't remember exactly what they, a case. Thank you. That's the word that I'm looking for, a case. Um, but wouldn't you know, irony struck and about, about three weeks after I bought my Fireboard, they released the Fireboard 2. So if you want to go to the next slide, this is the Fireboard 2. Um, this is what's on the market today. This is, this is uh, uh, from what I've heard, it's uh, just as good, if not better than the Fireboard 1, which I, I hope you would see over a generational change. Uh, obviously, it has the, the larger screen on the front to make it easier to read when you're out at the smoker. Um, but functionally, it's, it's essentially the same. You have six input ports that you can, can plug probes into. Um, that big port on the right side there, that's actually for a fan control. So if you're using uh, a motor controlled fan on a smoker, you can actually plug that right into, into your fireboard and fireboard will control the fan speed to control the, the internal ambient temperature of the smoker. Uh, next slide. So this is my setup. Um, one thing that uh, I've, I've just started to do over time is, is when I smoke, I, I smoke for volume. Um, we do a lot <laughs> when, when we're going to go through the effort of smoking meat, we do a lot of meat. So on the left here, this was, this was my second to last smoke. Um, I did 30 pounds of bacon and then that is a pork butt there on the bottom. Uh, the pork butt took about nine hours and the, the bacon we put in midway through the pork butt smoke, which is why you see more color on that pork butt. Um, but the bacon only takes three to four hours to smoke after it cures for a week. So really, really, um, when, when people think of bacon, they get kind of intimidated, but it's actually a really simple process. It just takes about a week to cure. Um, you can see the fireboard, uh, the, the case that, that I bought with it has, a, has, has magnets on the back. So it sticks right to the side of my smoker. And if you're interested, um, the smoker that I, I, I bought, it's a Pit Boss uh, Copperhead series. I think it's their 500 series. It's a big, big smoker. Um, I, I want to say I have 14 cubic feet in there, but don't quote me on that. That might be high now that I think about it. Um, but it's a pellet fed, it's a pellet fed smoker. It's really low maintenance. I mean, when I started smoking, I started with charcoal, I moved on to propane and I just realized that I want to be able to do it without babysitting it, babysitting it. So these, these pellet fed smokers just feed the, the pellets in it maintains its own temperature. Um, but the, the thermostats that come with these smokers are notoriously bad and notoriously inaccurate. So um, I remember when Will came into the Influx Pits channel asking for, for recommendations on how to get started. I said, get it, get a thermometer, whether it's a fireboard or something else, just, just get something that, that is more accurate than what's gonna come with the smoker. Uh, so next slide. So Will already talked a little bit about Telegraph, um, but like him, I, I use Telegraph to actually collect the data that uh, the Fireboard sends to, the, to the, its cloud servers. Telegraph has a uh, Fireboard input plugin, so it will actually scrape data from the Fireboard API. So next slide. And I'm gonna, I'm gonna have you click through a few times here. Oh, sorry. So this, this is just an example of my Telegraph configuration. I have my output using the InfluxDB v2 output plugin. So this is, this is sending data either to a OSS 2.x instance or InfluxDB cloud. And then the Fireboard input, all it requires is your Fireboard auth token, which you can retrieve from their API. It's really simple to get. Next. So you have your Fireboard um, and then that sends the data up to the Fireboard cloud servers, which then Telegraph will scrape that data from those servers and then store that in InfluxDB. It's a really simple, simple data flow and incredibly simple to set up. Um, all you need is that Telegraph config. Um, the, when you create the, your Fireboard account, your your uh, thermostat is actually registered with that account and any data it collects, it automatically sends up to that account. Um, it connects to Wi-Fi 
uh, it can either or it can also connect to your phone via Bluetooth and use your your phone's network to send the data up to um, to those servers. So it they they've built a really seamless system that um, it does come out of pre premium. The the fireboards start at I think um, 180 US dollars. So they're they're not cheap. But I've I've been through a few of these wireless thermometers, and for me, with the amount that I smoke um, and the the just the ease of, of use and the quality of life that it provides me, for me, it was worth it. And I, I made the investment and I haven't regretted it at all. Next slide. So once that data is in InfluxDB, um, then you get to start to have some fun with it. So this is, this is an example dashboard that I built for uh, monitoring fireboard data. Uh, to be honest, if you're using a fireboard, um, in FlexDB, it does provide some great visualization tools, but Fireboard actually provides out-of-the-box visualization tools for you that you can, um, you can use. So if you go to the next slide, they, you have a, an in-browser dashboard for your current smoking session, and they store all your historical smoking sessions, so you can look back at them. Um, they have uh, an iPhone and an Android app. If you go to the next slide, here's a, a picture of my phone with... Um, my smoking session um, from July. And they even have an Apple Watch app so you can get the live readings of, of your, um, your thermostat. And there's a really blurry image of that next. Um, that's, I, I, it, it will only display the current reading. You can't see historical, um, historical temperature readings. Um, so I haven't, I, in preparing for this, this meetup, I, I wasn't, I didn't have a smoke session. So I wasn't able to get a, my own picture of, of the watch. So here's a blurry picture of what it looks like on the watch. So where the real value comes in um, for me, and you can go ahead to the next slide with uh, storing my fireboard data in InfluxDB. Again, it's, it's not so much the real time, um, overview of what's happening in the smoker because because fireboard they, they give you that out of the box for me it's what i can do with the data after that um, and specifically uh, monitoring and alerting uh, the the problem that we all talked about detecting that that uh that stall so one one thing that i one of the reasons i got the smoker that i did is i uh, i like a low mo low maintenance smoke but i also like to smoke overnight and still get a, a good night's sleep um, generally I do this with like a beef brisket. I'll put it in at nine or 10 the night before, fill up my smoker with, with pellets and, and make sure the water tray is good. And then I, I go to bed. Um, but I generally hit that stall somewhere between 3 AM and, and 7 AM. I mean, but that's a, that's a pretty wide range of, uh, of time that I, I could be sleeping. Um, so what I would love and, and what I did is I want to be notified when the meat starts to stall so I can just get up and wrap it. So if you go to the next slide. So this is a task that's running on InfluxDB and, and I'm gonna walk through certain sections of it just to explain it. Um, and there's, uh, I've actually, since I wrote this, I've, I've thought of a better way to do it, but, but this is where it stands as of now. Um, if you click next, it'll highlight, uh, if I, here I have, um, I have a meat probes variable and the way that, that Fireboard sends data to its to its API and then Telegraph pulls that into InfluxDB is, is every point is assigned a probe uh, or a channel. So you, you can identify what which probe the temperature is coming from. So in this case, I'm specifying, okay, probe two and three are my meat, my meat probes. Those are the ones I want to detect the stall on. Um, so I, I'm pulling data from my Fireboard bucket over the last 15 minutes, because that's what I want to use to detect if I'm stalling. Uh, it could be longer. Uh, in fact, I, I would recommend it being longer. Just stalls can, can take a little while to set in. Um, and then I'm filtering on the fireboard measurement and I'm making sure that I only return points that are in my meat probes variable, that, that array. So if you click next, um, I then take the difference. So I'm, I'm, I'm calculating the difference between each of the, the points and creating a five minute average for that difference and then using that average to assign a status. So if, if the value is actually less than zero, which it does happen, I have an example, um, that means my meat is cooling and it's not good. <laughs> Usually means my smoker died and I need to go change something or fix something. Um, 
if if the if the difference is is less than 0 0.02 degrees over a five minute period, it's stalling. Um, that can be adjusted based on your tolerance of a stall. Uh, but for me, that's that's when I want to be notified that it's stalling is 0 0.02 degrees every five minutes. Um, and that's if you think about it, that's a really really slow. You you want to make sure that that you take care of that. Anything other that than that, it's cooking. Um, so I then, with those statuses assigned, I then use the the monitoring and alerting API that's built into InfluxDB Cloud and InfluxDB OSS 2.0, and um, specifically the the monitor package in Flux provides the check function that allows you to to logically assign statuses or levels to um, to whatever logic is or whatever columns exist in your data. So based on, on the statuses that I assigned in the previous function, the map function, if it's cooling, it's, it's a critical status. I want to know about it. Um, if it's stalling, worn, if it's OK, or if it's cooking, it's OK. And then I generate a message that says probe one, two, three, whatever appears to be and whatever the status is. And that, that pipes this data into the InfluxDB monitoring system where I can then build notifications based on, on the data that's being stored in the monitoring bucket in InfluxDB. So in this case, when I'm detecting the stall, um, the only change that I really care about is when it goes from, from cooking to stalling. If it goes from cooling to stalling, I know it's back on the way up. So I, I don't really care about that. I only care about cooking to stalling because that, that tells me it's slowing down. Um, so I, I just some really basic logic for this notification rule when my status changes from okay to warn. Um, in this case, it sends a notification to Slack. Um, in, in my own personal use case, I actually, I actually use push bullet. So it sends a notification to my phone and will wake me up um, when I'm sleeping. So uh, push bullet is, is uh, another one of those flux endpoints that you can use that isn't supported through the UI yet, but it will be. Um, but you can, you can do it in raw flux. Um, next. So that, that's a great way to detect the stall, to get up and to wrap it, um, make sure that the cook's going well. Another thing that I love to do is, is comparative analysis and just look at my different sessions and uh, see how they compare, if I notice any trends, um, things I could change. Um, and I actually learned, I learned a hard lesson through doing this. Um, if you go to the next slide, all right, so this, this is a, a query that I use to compare sessions. I'm essentially si assigning uh, two different time ranges to two different variables, and then I union those, those time ranges together. And then using the experimental align time function, you essentially uh, align the start times of, of those two streams of data. So they overlay each other when you visualize them. And, and the next slide shows the overlay of these two sessions. So if you look at these, um, the purple line and the blue line are actually one session. The blue line is my temperature data or my, my ambient temperature data and the, the purple line is my, my meat probe. Um, that one, that session was a little spotty because uh, I was running Telegraph on my local machine and I forgot to, to tell it not to go to sleep. So it was going to sleep and waking up all through the night. So it, the, the data was a little spotty throughout the night and it was also on a Saturday. So even, even in the day, it was a little spotty. Um, but if you look at the, the pink line and the orange line, this was another smoke session that I had. Um, so there's that big dip in that orange line. Um, so what had happened is I knew my meat was stalling. So I took it out of the smoker, but the butcher paper that I had to wrap it in, and, and I prefer butcher, butcher paper over, over uh, foil. It's, it's personal preference. Um, butcher paper tends to breathe a little, a little bit better. So if you have a good bark on your, your brisket, it'll preserve that bark instead of getting soft or sticky. Um, but anyway, side note, butcher paper is an alternative to foil when it comes to wrapping. Um, anyway, I, I took my brisket out and the butcher paper that I had was too small. So I had to run inside, tear new butcher paper, um, come out, finally got it wrapped, it, all in all, the, the, the brisket was out of the smoker for about 20 minutes. And this was in the middle of July. It was, it was like 95 degrees that day. So it wasn't a, a cool day, 
Um, but being out of the smoker that long, you can see just changed the trajectory of my entire smoke. And it ended up being about two hours longer than this other session that I had in April, just because of those 20 minutes that, that I let that, that, that brisket stay out. Um, I was getting really worried when I saw that cooling trend last for, uh, for a long time. Um, but when it comes to those dips in, in meat temperature and, um, and wrapping versus not wrapping, I mean, it, it can be a difference of, of two to five hours in your cook time. Like it's, it's crazy how much of a difference it makes. Uh, next. Some other things on my punch list, um, I'd love to do some forecasting where I could estimate the, the remaining cook time. This is really only valuable in the final hours of, of the, the smoke after you hit the stall because then you start to get that grad, gradual slope. If you're doing this in the middle of the, the rise, um, it, it's gonna tell you that your, your cook time is a lot shorter than it's actually going to be. So this is something that I'm looking into. Some enhanced visualizations, just figuring out how I can change visualizations using flux, uh, flux query logic and um, some of the, the dashboarding functionality that InfluxDB Cloud and InfluxDB OSS 2.0 provide. And just some more notifications. Tell me when it's done, tell, tell me when it's cooling, things like that. So it's almost lunchtime for me. Um, I'm hungry and I figured I would share the love. This, these are some of the results of, of my adventures over the years. Um, on the left there is, is some, some pulled pork that I did. Uh, this, was, this was that pulled pork um, that we saw earlier in the picture of my smoker. And on the right is the bacon from that same smoke. Um, but, but before I cut it, I absolutely love the caramel color of bacon. So um, again, it's almost lunchtime for me. I'm hungry. I'm gonna, I might end up drooling a little bit. Uh, next is two examples of beef brisket. One, the one on the left is a Texas style beef brisket that I did, uh, I think this was last Christmas. And then the brisket on the left is actually a pastrami that we did over St. Patrick's Day. And man, that made some killer, killer Reuben sandwiches. So good. Uh, I'm, I'm excited to do this again. And um, generally when you're trimming a brisket, you have to cut off a large section of the flat because it's too thin and it'll just burn. So I like, to, I like to hold on to that section of the flat and then I do a pastrami out of it. Um, and then next, this was one of my favorite smokes actually. This was two spatchcock turkeys that we did, um, not this last Thanksgiving, but Thanksgiving of, of 2019. Um, that, uh, yeah, if, you, if you've ever tried to, to uh, roast or smoke a whole turkey, you probably know the pain that is involved in keeping those breasts moist and, and cooking the legs. Like it's, it's a challenge, um, but I found if you spatchcock it, so you, you cut out the spine uh, of the bird and then you can, can lay it flat. Um, both of these birds took about three hours to, to fully cook and both the leg meat and the breast meat were totally moist um, and all monitored with the fire board. Um, next. So if you're interested in, in some of the work that I've done on, on creating dashboards for fireboard data, uh, the uh, alerting task for detecting the stall, there's a community template for, for fireboard that, that just went up this morning. Uh, and if, you, if you're interested, you can, can install that in InfluxDB Cloud or InfluxDB OSS. If you go to the next slide, there's a quick preview of, of the dashboard again. And, and um, on GitHub, you can see everything that that InfluxDB template includes. And I think that's all I have for you today. Okay, so I am definitely hungry after all of those photos. Um, thank you both Will and Scott for two fantastic presentations. Before we go into uh, the q and just wanted to remind everyone again, we have another virtual meetup. You know, we try to have them every month. Um, so the next one is on January 6th and Luke Bond, who's part of our engineering team, We'll be talking about how he uses InfluxDB to monitor his homebrew setup. So it looks like we have a few questions. Before we go into everyone else's questions, Scott, how long does 30 pounds of bacon last your family? Um, <laughs> depending on the season, it will last us about three months. Um, a little shorter when it's colder because we, we like the, the warmth that, that bacon, bacon brings. <laughs> That's not bad. I mean, that's a lot of bacon. Um, all right. So 
Uh, someone asked if it's going to be posted on YouTube. Yes, it will be posted on YouTube later today. Um, and Steve brought up um, talking about the difference between foil and, and uh, butcher paper to push through the stall. Um, I'm going to unmute you, Steve, um, if you want to uh, provide any more feedback on that, you can. Uh, let's see here. Oh, it looks like Steve dropped. Oh, well. I just think it's interesting that that came up a, a couple of times. I, I'm more more than happy to talk more about it if if anybody's interested, because I <laughs> I think I think both provide value, and it, it really depends on on what result you're trying to get. For example, if I'm doing a brisket, I tend to go with with butcher paper because I like that that crunchy bark you get on the outside of a beef brisket, and I want to maintain that. So what butcher paper allows allows you to do is it is it still vents moisture. Um, but not enough to, you'll, you'll still push through the stall, but it, it vents enough moisture that you, you don't lose that crunchy bark. You still keep that, that, that crunch and that bite in the bark. But if I'm doing like a, like a pork butt, I'll wrap that in foil because I don't really care about the bark on a pork butt. I just want the, I just want that, that rich smoky flavor. I'm, I'm going to end up pulling it anyway. Um, and the, the sticky bark, when you pull the, pull the pork butt, it, it just gets mixed in with everything else. So um, it's not too important to me when I when I do a pork butt. So I have my opinions, but I think that's that's what Steve was talking about. Awesome. Um, what software are you using to build your dashboard? In FluxDB. Of course. Yeah. <laughs> uh, the 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 visualizations um, are, are, are building of dashboards and cells is. I find it so easy to do in cloud too. Um, it's a grid system. You can drag the cells to and, and resize them to any size you want pretty much. Uh, it's very easy to update uh, and you can even put them under source control now. So you can have the you know, very fine grained control over it all. Um, and yeah, most importantly, it's a lot easier than building it yourself. And the cool thing Oh, oh sorry, sorry. I was just going to say the cool thing with InfluxDB 2.0 is all the the visualization is all right there in this in the one platform. Yeah, so so side note, the the uh, JavaScript library used to build the the visualizations inside of the InfluxDB UI is actually open source. It's it's called Giraffe. Um, it's available. It's inside the Influx data organization on GitHub. The Giraffe repo is, um, but we have community members working on visualization types adding those to draft to which will eventually hopefully end up in the influx db product itself but you can also use draft externally to build your own dashboards using the the framework and the tools that that have already been built for influx db and shameless plug we do have a webinar coming up in january all about uh the draft visualization so if you guys want to learn more check that out um all right so it looks like we have a question uh for you will what is the advantage of using MQTT? Uh, could it be possible for Telegraph to collect directly? Is it just to store measurements until a Telegraph can retrieve them or collect them in batches? Um, good question. So uh, MQTT, despite having uh, the, the word Q in its name, isn't actually a queuing system. It doesn't, it doesn't batch data up. It just forwards it. It doesn't store it, it just forwards it. So. Um, Telegraph has got plugins for a lot of um, for data sources. It has a, a plugin for a, a file, so you can tell Telegraph to monitor a file, and it will every time that file changes, it could go in there and read numbers out of it. It could read strings and trim those down. Um, but it doesn't have a uh, well, as far as I know, it doesn't have a plugin that will talk Bluetooth low energy. Um, now, I, what I could do is have the script that I'm running, which does talk Bluetooth low energy, suck in those numbers from the thermometer and write them out to a file. And then I could run um, uh, Telegraph on that same Raspberry Pi, for example, watching that file and just sucking its numbers out of there. Um, but I already have MQTT running on my network anyway. Um, and anybody, any device on your network could subscribe to that same topic. Um, so Telegraph can be there listening to that topic and sending it off to InfluxDB. But equally, I could have any other service running on my network listening to that same topic um, and doing other things with that data. Um, you know, I could integrate it into, I don't know, the, the, the power supply for the electric smoker itself. And so 
you know, perhaps something on my local network could detect that the, the cook was done and switch the smoker off, or, for example. Um, so yeah, so the, the, the short answer is that uh, Telegraph, as far as I know, doesn't talk um, MQ, uh, doesn't talk Bluetooth, but it does talk um, MQTT. And so I just use MQTT as a transport between Bluetooth and Cloud2. Great. Um, so this is, of course, it, it's a little weird since it's a virtual meetup, but it still is a meetup. So we definitely have a little bit of swag. We do have these really fun uh, time series meetup stickers that feature the DeLorean. So for those of you who don't know, everything at Influx Data is Back to the Future themed. So I just put in uh, the chat and you can um, add it. Which meat is the best meat to smoke? Um, so, uh, just throw in some answers that you think is the best meat to smoke and Will and Scott will, uh, pick their favorite answer. And then I will reach out to you guys and get some stickers out to you because who doesn't, you know, love stickers and it, it's fun. It has the DeLorean on it. So let's see, we have brisket, the meat you have. <laughs> I, I like that. <laughs> So keep throwing them in. If you, um, if anyone has any other questions for Will and Scott, please feel free to post them or you wanna raise your hand in, um, in Zoom and I'm happy to unmute you. Don't be shy. <laughs> and Will and Scott are in the community Slack channel. So if you have any follow-up questions after the fact um, and you forgot to ask them or didn't think of it, you can find them there and you can always uh, reach out to me directly if you have any questions for them as well. So let's see, what is, so we have brisket, the meat you have, alligator, uh, half chicken. Yeah, I, I actually have a question for Olive, Oliver. I've never smoked alligator meat. I've never had alligator meat, but I'm curious, what's it like? All right, Oliver, you should be able to talk now. Ooh, a salami. I was gonna say I haven't had it barbecued, um, but I've had it fried. It tastes like chicken, actually. It's <laughs> like really oily chicken. I'm in I'm in Idaho, so I don't think I'm gonna be getting any alligator meat up here anytime soon. But I eat you do rattlesnake. Pizza. Oh yeah, I, I actually have had rattlesnake, not smoked but grilled. Yeah. I had alligator once in Florida. It didn't have much taste. I mostly ate it just to say I ate alligator. So we got so, a couple of pork belly, pork butt, ribs, a salami, a good salami, if you can believe it. Because I haven't had Texas style brisket in a while. I'm going to go with that. This is just making me hungry. <laughs> <laughs> so I, I think I actually have my winner. Um, it's okay. close enough to my answer that I think, I think I'll give it to him. My, my, my pick for the winner is going to be Bob Baylor. The meat you have is definitely the best meat to smoke. For me, it's all meat. Meat is always better with a little bit of smoke on it. So congratulations, Bob. You are my pick for the best answer to what is the best meat to smoke. It's the meat you have. I agree, uh, but I need to pick somebody else. That, um, and my personal favorite, uh, as Chris said, is ribs. So I'm going to go with ribs. Okay, perfect. And, okay, I got to say, I'm going to uh, give a shout out to Oliver. Uh, I'm going to add uh, Oliver as well, because alligator, I was not expecting alligator to be called out. So I'm going to reach out to all three of you to get some stickers and maybe some Influx DB socks out to you guys. Um, but it, it's, it's fun seeing what everyone is uh, barbecuing these days. All right, well, I think that wraps up today's uh, time series meetup. Thank you everyone for joining. I look forward to seeing you in the new year at all of our future events. Um, and we do have one more event tomorrow. We have the webinar with uh, Tim Hall. So if you have any more uh, InfluxDB related questions or you know maybe you've heard of InfluxDB IOX and you wanna ask questions and you missed the IOX talk last, last week, uh, come and join us. Um, you'll get to hear me talk lots more again tomorrow, but um, hope to see you all there. And I hope you all have a great uh, holiday season and look forward to seeing you at future events. Thank you.